Hello and welcome. I'm Father Methodius, priest and rector of the Birth of the Baptist Church in Pinckney, Michigan. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Prasforka. I hope this small offering will sustain and give you strength to live a life of piety and purity. In the previous episode, we were reminded that the Church has specific teachings about the body and its proper use. It is possible that God can work on us from within. This is something that he does to awaken us to our need for repentance, our need for salvation. This inner work, however, precedes the will of man, as it were, offering it incentives and encouraging it to humble itself. This inner working or awakening of grace requires our response, the response of faith or works in keeping with repentance. However, we also learned, contrary to popular impressions, that God will not continue to offer these opportunities. We listened as St. Theophon the Recluse quoted the prophet Isaiah, saying to the people of God, Ye have become loathsome to me. I will no longer pardon your sins. With this dual testimony, the Holy Fathers quoting the sacred scripture, it is hard to imagine how whole generations of Orthodox Christians have been raised to believe that they can live however they wish, expecting the just judge of the universe to pardon them. In the church, we say God forgives. It's true. But forgiveness requires repentance. We should know this because while forgiveness has become an abstraction in our times, our Lord teaches us using concrete real-life examples to show how God requires our repentance and that his forgiveness of us is predicated in our humility, repentance, and our desire to forgive those we consider our debtors. One example from Scripture should suffice to prove this point. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, Leave there thy gift before the altar, and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, and then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly, whilst thou art in the way with him, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver thee to the officer, and thou be cast into prison. This practical example from real life teaches us how God's dealing with us will be commensurate and of a kind corresponding to our humility, sorrow over sins, and desire to be at peace with others. As I have said previously, salvation is no joke. And the recluse said that self-deception is the most formidable covering that keeps us from realizing this. We dealt with the body in the last episode, and much more could be said about it. I would recommend the teachings of St. Hezekios the priest from the Philokalia as a helpful guide explaining the relationship between the body and the inner battle we must fight. In this episode, continuing in chapter 6, we will begin by looking at the section on cares and scattered thoughts, seeing how the body must be dealt with before much progress can be made in the life of the mind. Cares and Scattered Thoughts Cares, says the recluse, do not leave any time to work on oneself. When they are present, you have one matter on your hands and ten more in your head. If I were to leave that quote alone, you could almost see it framed and placed on a wall in someone's living room. It has all the quality of a folk saying. But the fact is that cares afflict all of us and the prominent role they play in our life comprises the net we find ourselves in called self-deception. And for most of us, the line between cares and scattered thoughts is not obvious. Therefore, you must put aside cares for a time, all without exception. You will take up your usual affairs later on, but for now let them cease— Fling them from your hands and throw them out of your thoughts. Vladika gives us advice that many have likely heard from their spiritual fathers. Anyone who has attended the Divine Liturgy has been instructed to do so for a time. 
Let us now lay aside all earthly care, the choir chants. But apart from the divine liturgy, how is this setting aside of all cares to be done? Many people can barely make time to attend the liturgy on a Sunday morning. I hear horror stories about the busy lives and jobs that require people more and more to absent themselves from the life of the church. Some of the pe- Some of these people have made their way to the parish I serve. They find that attending services during the week is impossible. For them, Sunday liturgy and possibly Vespers on Saturday evening have them maxed out. If today's Orthodox are to make progress, it will be necessary for them to change the way they live. Even if they could take some time, even if they could push the cares out of their heads for a moment, this would not be enough. They may have tried somewhat, but the saint says, once the cares have ceased, the whirlwind still remains in the head. One thought after another, one in agreement, another diametrically opposed. Why is this the case, you may ask? Our teacher tells us that the soul is scattered and the mind swings in different directions and thus does not allow you to retain anything lasting and steadfast. Thus, spiritual work is seen to be something we must persevere in, not something we do once that has any lasting corrective effects. Orthodox spirituality is not something that one engages in from time to time. That is, many people do attempt to dip into orthodoxy periodically, but they make no progress this way. Unless orthodoxy has become the manifest pattern of one's life, his thoughts, like scattered children, will develop a life of their own. Rather than being corralled like a flock or like a looking glass gathers scattered rays of light, they will lead man out and away from himself. He will be distracted and captivated by every impression. This sounds bad. For those who will not do the work, it is bad. We often think of monastics as being those who do this work, but I trust I have sufficiently debunked the myth that lay people are off the hook. How should lay people live, though? And how can they avail themselves of opportunities often thought to be the possession of monastics only? The desire to go deeper within yourself and work on yourself, to cut off your scattered thoughts and cares, of course, inevitably requires the following means. Solitude on the one hand, and on the other, cessation of usual occupations, both personal and duty-related. And here is where the excuses start to trickle in. You say, what am I supposed to do? Quit my job? I don't have time for that. Fasting is too hard for me. I have a family. What am I supposed to do? The God-illumined bishop instructs us, first of all, This humbling of the flesh requires a change in the way you satisfy your natural needs. In this light, the most convenient time to change your life should be considered to be during a fast, especially Great Lent. It is treated as optional, but Great and Holy Lent is an obligation. All Christians, with a few exceptions like pregnant and nursing mothers, the very old or the sick, are obliged to keep the fast. I remember a strange practice I used to experience while in world orthodoxy. Every year, towards the end of the longer fasts, one priest I knew for years would remind the so-called faithful that if they had not yet begun to fast, they had two weeks left, then one week left. Then, if you have not begun to fast yet, Holy Week is here a great time to begin your fast. This priest knew that his people should fast, and he wanted to remind them of this. But he also feared them and wanted to make sure that no one would feel pressured into, oh, give me a break. No one felt pressured to do anything. He didn't want to give the impression that life in the church is an obligation. He made orthodoxy yet another option to choose from amid the otherwise worldly lives of his people. But Lent, far from being an option, is the opportunity par excellence for the Orthodox faithful to enter deeply into themselves. The saint says, everything is set up for this during Lent, 
at home, in church, and even in society. Of course, our society doesn't account for this. But he continues, During this time, everything is looked upon as preparation for repentance. Just the same, this does not mean that when the beneficial thought has come to change your life, you should put off its fulfillment until the fast begins. Everything required during this time can be fulfilled at any other time other than fasting. If you are troubled by my saying that fasting is obligatory and that the faithful are obliged to keep the fasts, not just Great Lent, but all of them, let me unpack that last quote. St. Theophon the Recluse says that everything the church prescribes during the fast is required. If you struggle to understand what he might mean by this, the dictionary on my computer offers the following definition. Required. Officially compulsory or otherwise considered essential, indispensable. Some synonyms include essential, vital, indispensable, necessary, needed, requisite, prerequisite, compulsory, obligatory, mandatory, prescribed, and statutory. While antonyms, words that mean the opposite, include optional, and inessential. If you haven't fallen over backward thinking that I sound arrogant and condescending, you may know something about how these things are usually dealt with in the parishes. Fasting is a requirement, and for good reasons. I'm not trying to sound snarky. What else does Vladika say about it? But when the holy fast has arrived, it is a sin to miss the chance to take care for the salvation of your soul, as it is often missed at another time period if anyone who has had the salvific thought outside of the fast to change his life, and whose life hinders him from carrying it out. It would be better for him to retreat for a time to a monastery. There it will be easier for him to master himself. If you don't like how I said it, St. Theophan is not timid to say that keeping the fast is required, but that failing to do so is a sin. Carelessness, insensitivity, and blindness. If one has taken up the ascetical battle, if he has made some progress in changing the normal occupations that keep him distracted from his inner life, we can now move inward and begin to wake up the sleeping man and force upon him various ideas, more or less strong and startling. If the body is subdued through much difficulty, the lazy thought life must undergo great mental exertion if the attention is to be collected, focused, and directed properly. In Orthodox asceticism, one enters into himself not to escape others, nor to lose himself in a total absorption into the all. What the courageous encounter when they struggle to turn inward is the self. The self is what has been hiding or has been buried, as he says, beneath all the deceptive coverings. Orthodox asceticism, far from being an escape from reality, is a way of removing the blinders that keep us from it. Such blindness is the result of inattentiveness to himself. The person does not know himself because he has never entered inside himself and has never thought about himself or his moral condition. This is really why people avoid orthodoxy generally and why orthodox people approach orthodoxy as they would other religions. The blindness that obscures our understanding of reality is a blindness to our own sinful condition. Apart from God's grace, no one really wants to know himself as sinful. Vladika says, But for the most part, his blindness is supported by certain prejudices concerning himself. The person creates a net of thoughts, systematically closing himself off to himself. Perhaps these thoughts are but as spider webs, that is, they are of the slightest probability, but the mind never took them apart carefully, and the heart speaks very loudly of their reality and truthfulness. This is moral delusion, 
or prejudice which comes from the heart's intrusion into things belonging to the reason. That is why it is necessary to unite particular soberness to deep attention at this moment, renouncing every deceit of an evil heart. And I would interject that it is precisely at this moment where spiritual guidance, the revelation of thought, and trust in a spiritual father is to be found so important. Very few enter into themselves, and you can see why. It is difficult to do, and once entered, the inner world can be confusing, and the self-deception that once barred entry can return in the form of spiritual delusion, prelest, we call it. It is very easy for the inexperienced to confuse psychological experiences for spiritual ones. He says, If the heart needs to feel something at this moment, let it feel it under the influence of the mind's formulations and not all by itself, sort of running ahead. Otherwise, it will again force the reason to imagine things as the heart likes. Again, It will force the reason to submit to the heart, again bringing disorder to the understanding, and instead of enlightening, it will only sink it into deeper blindness. Until the heart is purified, deceit lurks there. Section 3. Section 3. Thought Processes That Keep One in Blindness. In this section, the recluse exposes some of the most common deceptions used to blind people from the true conditions of spiritual battle. It may come as a surprise to read that no hope should be taken because someone is called a Christian or Orthodox. He says, I am a Christian, you say, and content yourself with this. This is the first deceit transferring to yourself the privileges and promise of Christianity without any care to root true Christianity into yourself or to ascribe to yourself that which can only be acquired by your strength and inner worthiness. Explain to yourself that it is illusory to hope in a name, that God can raise a son of Abraham from a stone, and can take away your promise at any time if the conditions for participating in them are not soon fulfilled. This is startling for us. Another more common deception is hinted at. That is a comparison with others. He says, after all, we are not the worst. We know a thing or two, and if we judge anything we are after, we will be able to judge correctly. This may qualify as a temptation from the right, as our beloved archpastor has described them. I encounter people regularly who are interested in the theoretical aspects of genuine orthodoxy, but who have no desire to enter into the spiritual battle where they become the chief of sinners. The recluse says, this is how some are deluded by their psychological expertise. Others to the contrary, are deluded by physical perfection, strength, beauty, and form. Both one and the other are more sharply blinded the higher they stand above those around them. So many current trends in orthodoxy can be corrected by what follows. He says, Assure yourself that natural perfections have no moral value whatsoever because they are not your own accomplishment but are given to us by God. Everything natural is of even less value in Christianity because nature was corrupted by the fall. Sanctify all your good qualities with faith in Christ, the Savior, and a life according to that faith, and only then view it as good. Again, have you done everything you can and should according to your gifts? You are responsible for more because you have been given more. The concern is not abilities, but their application. Do you have anything to show for them? Does the profit correspond to the expenditure? There's a good question. As for any physical or incidental advantages, there is nothing to say. St. John Chrysostom somewhere exhibits one man who praises another for his good looks, stateliness, 
wealth, nice house, his excellent choice horses, etc., and then directs the following speech to him. Why haven't you told me anything about the man himself? All that you have described is not him. I often tell my people that it is unwise for them to compare themselves with each other or with others. But this does not leave us without those we can measure ourselves against. Vladika says, But there is no reason to look at others. Let us look after ourselves, Everyone shall answer for himself. Look at your own self, and cutting yourself off from others, judge yourself only without comparing yourself to others. If you do want to compare yourself with others, then compare yourself with the holy God pleasers. They are the living Christian law, an example for those who wish to be saved. If you judge yourself in comparison to them, you will not make a mistake. Why do the saints provide such a helpful standard for us to live up to? Because if we compare ourselves with ourselves or with those around us, we can easily conclude that we are not so bad, as he says. The only thing keeping us from being far worse than we are is our lack of courage. We are too afraid of the trouble we would attract if we acted any worse than we do. The recluse says, it seems that we are not doing anything disgraceful, and others do not view us as bad, do not deprive us of the respect and attention, and that these are not just everyday people, but important individuals. The thickest and murkiest veil of blindness is the good appearance of external behavior and external relationships. He adds, Make it clear to yourself more impressively that the external is worthless without the internal. External good behavior is the leaf, while internal good disposition is the fruit. The fig tree leaves promised fruit, but the Savior, not finding any on the tree, cursed it. It is the same with any externally well-ordered person who stands before God's face without a sincerely good and God-fearing heart. Another, so there is badness in me. Am I the only one? The great tragedy of thinking this way is explained by the recluse when he says, Thus do we blind ourselves with the ordinariness of sin around us. Explain to yourself that the large number of sinners does not change the law of righteousness and does not relieve anyone's responsibility. We often get this one so wrong. While the historical, theological, eschatological, and exegetical discussion surrounding the apocatastasis involved some of the greatest minds of the church and of all history— Today, a version of it is apparent when we eliminate the possibility of a coming judgment because we think that we are not alone in our sinfulness. Apocatastasis is described by Eusebius as the culmination of the most blessed hope. But does he follow his teacher Origen in the notion that restoration will preclude any judgment of man's sin or the sin of the evil one and his demons? God does not grade on a curve. The church condemned this as heresy, but unlike its historical precursor, which is more closely defined and condemned as a restoration, apocatastasis, of demons and evil human beings that will put an end to temporal punishment, today's apocatastasis eliminates culpability from the human experience by calling on the supposed badness of others to excuse my own sinfulness. Let us not be deceived. The Bishop of Visha reminds us, God does not look at numbers. If everyone has sinned, he will punish everyone. Look at how many people were born before the flood and all perished except for eight souls. In Sodom and Gomorrah, five cities were consumed by fire from heaven, and no one was saved except for Lot and his daughters. The torments of hell will be no easier just because so many are being tormented there. On the contrary, won't this only intensify the suffering of each one? Before I finish this episode, I want to revisit a statement made by our God-enlightened teacher. 
There are many ways that we should see ourselves as separate from others. In terms of our sins, we have seen many ways in which we wrongly evaluate ourselves as part of a group. Other people are bad. My sins aren't as bad as others. Surely, we think, my good works are worth a great deal. These are just some deceptions we have been warned against. We should judge ourselves separately from others, using the righteousness of God and the example of the righteous ones, the saints, as our standard. There is a wrong way to separate ourselves from the group, though, and this is a direct path to self-deception. Some of us know that we should not take upon ourselves spiritual feats that are above our strength. The reason for this is that we will be overwhelmed and fall. But this is not the worst thing that can happen. Holy Fathers teach us that this kind of fall can lead one to repentance and humility. It can bring one to true knowledge of oneself. The recluse warns against taking bodily labors, such as fasting on, independently. He says that other things, like focusing on the beneficial thoughts to change your life, should be addressed as soon as they arrive. For example, if you have been skipping church, as soon as you realize the foolishness of this, start attending. If you have been lazy in keeping your prayer rule, if you don't have a prayer rule, get a prayer book and start immediately. If you have been sinning by misusing your body, if you have developed addictions to porn, to entertainment, to voyeurism by constantly checking your Instagram, if you are in a sinful relationship, these things should be dealt with at any time and immediately. He says, just the same, this does not mean that when the beneficial thought has come to change your life, you should put off its fulfillment until the fast begins. Everything required during this time can be fulfilled at any other time. So what is it that should not be undertaken independently? What is it that could harm someone if he undertook it on his own through self-will? He says, Everything required during this time can be fulfilled at any other time other than fasting. But when the holy fast has arrived, it is a sin to miss the chance to take care for the salvation of your soul as it is often missed at another time. Today, fasting is done in and outside of the church. It should be said that the diet craze infecting the world is nothing new. It should also be said that many people mistakenly liken orthodox fasting to a diet. One book offers a method for fasting colored over with orthodox tones, but which is not more than the product of a humanistic health frenzy. Fasting should be done with the church, according to the church, with the methods and goals appointed by the church. The description of the book I have in mind explains that the three pillars of the Athos diet are designed to work together to support you in creating a bodily environment of hormonal health. Clearly, on this basis, the so-called Athos diet should not be regarded as orthodox. Rather, it is a diet that apes external measures observed in orthodox communities where fasting is commonplace, such as monasteries. And contrary to its adherents, those who have replaced their orthodox fasting with the so-called Athos diet, those who wish to fast with the church will seek the spiritual oversight of a spiritual father. A book may be helpful, but spiritual guidance is indispensable. So we know that the Athos diet has as its goal to support you in creating a bodily environment of hormonal health. How does it seek to accomplish this, and how is this different from orthodox fasting? The Athos diet sits atop three pillars of 1. Intermittent fasting, decreasing the number of times we eat daily and shortening the window of our meal times, helps the body to repair and restore cells, as well as improve insulin sensitivity, ultimately reducing the risk of metabolic diseases and strengthening the immune system. The second pillar, high protein, plant preferred. Choosing high protein foods that are plant based helps stabilize our hormone levels and reduce our environmental impact. And the third pillar, walking. 
Exercising for 30 minutes every day will increase muscular insulin sensitivity as well as improve mental health and brain function. And they recommend starting with walking. With all we have learned from this and the previous sections, when we discuss the body, the cares of life, and scattered thoughts, we should quickly perceive the worldly and superficial quality of this approach. But in case we missed it, we can read on to discover for just whom this book is designed. This lifestyle may have external similarities to the kinds of activities the uninitiated observer may make on a vacation to holy places. The book's abstract describes the Holy Mount of Athos as a world heritage site, drawing in 300,000 tourists a year to explore this magical place found in Greece. With this view of Mount Athos as a tourist destination, it is no surprise that the book promotes this trendy diet as being conducive to the 21st century responsible citizen who is trying to live well for themselves, their families, and their global community. Global community? Give me a break. Live well for themselves? The Athos Diet book is simply another offering for trendy people who want to try something new, even if it is presented as being very old. We should be able to spot this immediately. St. Ignatius Brinchaninov makes the following statement concerning fasting in the church. Having resolved to consecrate ourselves to the service of God, let us make fasting the foundation of our effort. The essential quality of every foundation should be an unshakable firmness. Otherwise, it will be impossible to construct a building on it, however solid the building itself may be. So let us never on any account, on any pretext whatever, allow ourselves to break our fast by overeating and especially by drunkenness. Non-Orthodox approaches like the Athos diet, by definition, do not begin with the resolution to consecrate oneself to the service of God. The saint continues, Immoderate fasting, that is, prolonged excessive abstinence from food, is not approved by the Holy Fathers. From inordinate fasting and the exhaustion which results from it, a person becomes unfit for spiritual labors, frequently turns to gluttony, and often falls into the passion of boasting and pride. While experts would warn that intermittent fasting should not be divided between fasting and binging, the intermittent approach, much like the Islamic approach to fasting, is passionate. Prolonged periods of fasting are characterized by passion, irritability, and the anxious awaiting of the next feeding frenzy. Many people impress themselves when they go without food, but this self-satisfaction is unfounded because man was not made for food at all. Fasting, therefore, should humble us. The so-called 21st century globally responsible citizen knows little to nothing of humility. One review of the book celebrated the noticeable loss of body fat that resulted from replacing one's normal Lenten activity with the Athos diet. Notice, if you will, that the Athos diet promotes high-protein, hormone-stabilizing foods and exercise, including walking, as foundational to the overall health its prescribed methods bring about. If intermittent fasting is passionate, it is so because it does not seek to consecrate one's life to the service of God, but to bring about vitality and strength to live in a global community. St. Ignatius suggests that the use of food once a day, not to repletion, is regarded by the Holy Fathers as the best fast. Such a fast does not weaken the body by prolonged abstinence or overload it with excessive food, but keeps it fit for soul-saving activity. Fasting with the church is not a trend. The sainted Russian monastic and bishop Vladika Ignati continues, Such a fast presents no glaring peculiarity, and therefore the person fasting has no cause for boasting, to which people are so prone on account of virtue itself, especially when it stands out sharply. 
In conclusion, and returning to what Bishop Theophon wrote on the body, refuse it delights and pleasures, restrict indulgences, and even the most natural needs, lengthen the hour of vigil, decrease the usual amount of food, add labor to labor. Through this, the soul will free itself from the bonds of matter, will become more energetic, lighter, and more receptive to good impressions. The material body prevailing over the soul communicates to the soul the body's lethargy and coldness. Physical ascetic labors weaken these bonds and eliminate their effects. This is what orthodox fasting is capable of. If we want to enter in and work on our souls, fasting must not be a diet, but an ascetical offering of the whole man to the Lord. If you haven't considered supporting my missionary activity of teaching and preaching, please do so now. Your support keeps the lights on here as we try to bring genuine orthodoxy to Michigan and the world. Leave a comment or question if you would, and join me next time when I begin section four entitled, Cease Making Excuses and Sins and Work on Your Blindness. Once again, I'd like to thank you for joining me. Please remember to support us by spreading the word about genuine orthodoxy in Michigan. We appreciate also your financial support. To send donations through PayPal, please use fellowheirs at hotmail.com. Check out our website at Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church, no H at the end of Church.com. Birth of the Baptist Orthodox Church.com. God bless you.